new impeachment defense team. President Trump announcing that he had two new lead attorneys yesterday. This after reports first said his previous five-person team quit over the weekend. It's now attorneys David Schoen and Bruce Castor leading the team to represent Trump. The Senate trial is set to begin in just one week on February the 8th. Let's welcome in now Harvard Law School Professor Emeritus and Newsmax analyst Alan Dershowitz. Professor Dershowitz, great to see you. Thank you. All right, so uh, one week with a new team of lawyers. I imagine there's some continuity here, but uh, are you at all concerned about the timeline? Well, I don't think this is a complicated a legal case, there are really two essential issues. One, does the Senate have jurisdiction to try a former president? I think the answer to that is no. The Senate has already voted yes. I doubt there'll be much argumentation on that, uh, but he will probably be in the end acquitted because there are enough senators who don't think the Senate has jurisdiction. The second issue is whether a former president or any president can be impeached for making a constitutionally protected speech. I think that, too, is a fairly simple issue under the Brandenburg principle. Um, and so the question is, what kind of a trial will there be? How long will it take? Will there be really legal arguments? One reason I decided not to participate in this uh, trial is because I think it's political theater. I'm neither a politician nor an actor. I know David Schoen. He's a good lawyer, and I think he will add a lot to the team. Uh, he both understands how to make factual and legal arguments. So as far as I can tell, the president has uh, selected a good team. I think it would be a terrible mistake to try to put on trial that the election was stolen, that there was fraud. Um, you know, it's one thing to say the president believed that, that. It's quite another thing to try to prove to the Senate that it's true that the election was uh, was uh, uh, fraud. Uh, that will lose people like McCarthy. Connell and others who have already taken a strong position that there may have been some problems with the election, but certainly the outcome is not seriously in doubt based on the evidence that's now available. You know, you can almost see it in some of the zeal uh, based on the, the, what people are talking about going after President Trump here. And you mentioned the Brandenburg principle. And we're going to see this impeachment trial of the president, too. But we also hear about other people who made speeches ahead of the Capitol Hill, uh, you know, riot. And, and, and them being questioned about their own words. And I think, you know, there's a much bigger conversation that we have to have here in the concern for speech, uh, not just with the impeachment trial. We can see that in a more public way, but for other lesser known figures who are also being accused of inciting violence. Well, I'm writing about that. I have a new book that I'm working on called The New Censors, the censors from the hard left and progressives and, uh, and the Internet. And we're seeing a real attack on freedom of speech in America. And if a president were ever to be impeached for making a constitutionally protected speech, or if lawyers were to be disbarred for making constitutionally protected speeches, I think it would be the worst attack on our First Amendment since McCarthyism, and in some ways even worse than McCarthyism, because the people making the attack are our future leaders. They're mm -hmm. young people. They're not the last dying gasp of an old McCarthyism, which is what brought forth the 1950s. You know, and... and I think about this, too. You know, some of those speeches to me sounded like speeches that your coach would give you prior to a game. You know, sometimes there's some, you know, you, you can laugh at that a little bit, too. But that's eventually the road we could be going sure. down. If they start to infringe your speech in this type of, of arena, then who knows where the limits are. And it's also so selective. There have been so many progressive left wing radical speeches in the Capitol. Take over the Capitol. Show them we're strong. Fight back. You know, these kinds of rhetorical flourishes, which the Capitol really invites. And if there were ever to be a real trial on the president's speech, his defense attorney could introduce hundreds of other speeches, which make the president's speech seem like pablum. He said mm -hmm. he wanted peaceful, patriotic protests. Others have called for much more radical protests. Right. And when you have, you know, something that explicit in the speech, peaceful protests like that, if so many people want to pick and choose the words which may or may not have incited this violence, we also now know, too, from your legal perspective. Is, go ahead. The press never said peaceful or patriotic. I know that because I watch CNN and I watch PBS. <laughs> and if you watch CBS, right. PBS and you watch CNN and you watch uh, MSNBC, the president never said peaceful protest because that's the way we learn our history. We learn it from channels that now doctor tapes and edit things out. And so I know and you know the president said peaceful and patriotic. But many Americans don't know he used those words. Many Americans don't know that when the president said 
there are good people on both sides. He also said, and I mean to exclude Nazis and right. white nationalists. Don't know that because much of the media simply picks and chooses which words to show the American public. Everybody's entitled to their opinion, but not their own facts. And CNN specializes in presenting only the facts they want to have presented to their viewers. And by the way, GBH and PBS did the same thing in a frontline story the other day. They had both of those speeches. And in neither speech was the president, did the, the statements were included that the president said he didn't mean neo-Nazis, he didn't mean this, and he meant peaceful protests. I, I assume, uh, Professor Dershowitz, you're speaking... Uh, the new um, P PBS special, Frontline Special, uh, American Carnage. I have not had a, a chance to see that yet. Uh, but now, it, we have seen so much selective editing of Trump's speeches, uh, and it's concerning because, uh, because America is not getting the full picture here. I also want to talk to you. Peabody, it will win a Peabody, because if you attack Trump, you win a Peabody, even if you violate every principle of journalism, which is what Frontline did in that, in that story. As somebody who worked on the Peabody Awards in college, uh, that's disappointing to hear, to say the least. But uh, Professor Dershowitz, uh, let's talk to right now about the Nobel Peace Prize. And, you know, you are nominating, you've you know, nominated former President uh, Trump's senior advisor and son-in-law Jared Kushner uh, and his colleague Avi Berkowitz as well for their work on the Abraham Accords. Uh, it's hard to imagine a more difficult path than Jared had to do this. Uh, everyone discounting his ability to do this from the beginning, but you and I talked about this at the onset. You know, the way they looked at this with fresh eyes, knowing that you can't wait for uh, the Palestinian Authority to catch up with the reality of the situation that they had to move ahead and they were able to do so. You're absolutely right. I challenge anybody to come up with an alternative to the Abraham Accords, which better deserves the Nobel Peace Prize. According to the will of Alfred Nobel, there are three criteria for winning the Peace Prize. The Abraham Accords fits all of those. And yet Black Lives Matter has been nominated to win the Nobel Prize. They don't fit any of the criteria. And if the Abraham Accords deserves the Nobel Peace Prize, then you have to ask the question, who really brought them about? And although we have to give credit, obviously, to President Trump and Prime Minister Netanyahu and the emirs, uh, these are the guys who work behind the scenes, Kushner and Berkowitz and our two ambassadors, the ambassador from Israel to the United States, the ambassador from the United States to Israel, uh, David Friedman and, um, and Ron Dormer. They all have to be given serious consideration for winning this peace prize. Certainly, they deserve it much more than Barack Obama, who was nominated 11 days after he got into office. He was nominated for the peace prize, having done nothing except defeat George a Bush for, for the presidency. Well, and, you know, maybe beat the Peace Prize, because he's also, he's not Trump. And apparently, at least according to the Nobel Peace Committee, if you're not Trump and you're not Bush, you may deserve an award more than if you've done great things to bring about peace. So let's hope the Nobel Committee is fair. And if they're fair, I think these two young men will be given serious consideration for the Nobel Peace Prize. Well, I certainly think you make a great case for them. It does seem like the uh, Nobel Peace Prize is given for effect now more than actual reason, uh, like they're trying to generate headlines sometimes, but this certainly seems like a worthy cause. Thanks for your time, Professor Dershowitz, as always, we appreciate it. My pleasure, thank right. you. Well, President Trump's Save America Political Action Committee has raised $31.2 million by the end of last year. This is according to the latest financial report filed with the FEC. The fund was created just on November 9th, so do the math. That's a lot of money and not a lot of time. Now, Trump can only use this money, though, to boost his influence within the Republican Party and support other candidates and campaigns. He cannot use it for his own political campaigns. Meanwhile, Republican Illinois Congressman Adam Kinzinger is forming his own political action committee. It's an anti Trump pact. It's called Country First. Kinzinger says the Republican Party has lost its way and forgotten its principles. Here's a clip from the ad he released. I was there on January 6th. I was there when the mob began to shout violent threats and shatter windows in the capital of the United States. I was there when shots rang out. And I was there when people died. Sadly, I wasn't surprised because I've been watching the rhetoric leading up to that day and took it seriously. Republicans must say enough is enough. It's time to unplug the outrage machine, reject the politics of personality, and cast aside the conspiracy theories and the rage. All right, the congressman also singing out two of his colleagues, Ohio Congressman Jim Jordan and Georgia Congressman Marjorie Taylor Greene, calling them political terrorists. We'll keep you posted on what comes of it.
Meanwhile, lawmakers in Washington continue to go round in circles over COVID-19 relief. Today, President Biden is set to meet with a group of 10 Republican senators. This is a group uh, backing a, sm a much smaller $600 million, a billion dollar package. Some Democrats, like Senate Budget Committee Chairman Bernie Sanders, say they like something like one or two trillion dollars. That's the amount the country really needs. Both sides, though, say time is of the urgency and they're, it's shaping up to be the first real domestic policy test for President Biden because everyone here is going to get their feelings hurt just a little bit when it's all said and done. You just watched Newsmax TV, America's fastest growing cable news channel now in more than 70 million homes. You can get Newsmax TV on your cable system or check your cable guide. And if your system doesn't carry Newsmax, call them, tell them you want Newsmax TV because we're real news for real people.